Please turn in your Bibles to the book of Romans. I'll be reading Romans chapter 1. I would love to read all of the rest of chapter 1, but we're going to stop at verse 21, uh, starting with verse 18. Romans 1, verse 18 to 21. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. And so, they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Blessed is the reading of God's holy, infallible, instructive word to our hearts and minds and souls. Father, let us see what is written. Let us glean the meaning that you had your Apostle Paul put down on paper in parchment. So therefore, to that end, help me just say what's here. Expound, say it in different ways. That your glory would appear to us who are saved all the more clearly. And to any that aren't, it would be the means for their salvation. Do it, O Lord Jesus, by the power of your Spirit. Amen. Okay, what we have now as we begin in the body of Paul's large theological argument for the gospel begins really right here in verse 18 of chapter 1. And so what we have beginning in 18, verse 18 of chapter 1 all the way to chapter 3, verse 20, is an indictment of every human being what he's going to be doing. On Judgment Day, there will be no excuse for any of us. And what Paul does here, starting in verse 19, really, to the end of chapter 1, is his indictment against all non-Jews. Then, in chapter 2, verse 1, to chapter 3, verse 8, is his indictment against Jews. None of us in this room, whether you're Andrew or the rest of us, have any defense against God's charge. We've all sinned and we have all pushed, squelched, suppressed, The obvious, that there is a God who made all things and made us, and we are not Him. That suppression, we'll see in the weeks to come, always leads to deeper and deeper self-deception about reality. And it leads to that denial. To get through this temporal life, denial of the inevitable. Not one of us in this room is good or righteous before God in and of ourselves. In and of ourselves, Paul is telling us, 
all human beings are unrighteous. And the only hope to avoid the coming consequences of our guilt is the previous two verses that we spent a couple weeks in. The thesis statement, verses 16 and 17 of Romans 1. In other words, the gospel of Jesus. It's the only thing that some, somehow someone else's righteousness, innocence, that it would be put to our account before God in the courtroom of God. And that hope there actually does happen to most of us here in this room because it happens only by faith in Jesus Christ. So, let's go to the text. Notice, verse 18 begins with the word for. Meaning, it's connected to verses 16 and 17 that came right before it. It's connected to the, the gospel there in order to make clear why we all need the righteousness of God imputed to us as a gift. Why do we need it? Follow, the, follow his flow. For, here it comes, in other words, because... Ungodly and unrighteous people are presently under God's wrath. That's what he says. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness, ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, meaning of human beings, of men and women, of people. And so what we have for the rest of chapter 1 is, first, in verse 18, it's the reality of God's wrath. Then, from verses 19 to 23, he gives us the reason for God's wrath. And then, in verses 24 to 32, we won't get there this morning, he gives the result of God's wrath. So first, the truth, the reality of our Creator's righteous wrath for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness, ungodliness and unrighteousness of people. Apostle Paul knows not only what is true, but he knows how to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. He starts with the wrath of God. And what is subsumed in that is God's holiness, His being, who He is, and that He then created, and thus, because of sin, there is God's wrath, which is against every sinner. Because He knows no one will grasp the actual gospel. The meaning of the good news of Jesus Christ without the backdrop of our own personal guilt before God. The good news of the gospel is the announcement to people who are under God's indictment and exposed to His wrathful judgment. That's Paul. Paul did not go around 
town to town, in city to city, and proclaim to people, God loves you unconditionally. He wouldn't do that. He wouldn't do it because he knows it is not true. And people who hear that kind of a message like they do in our day, they may conclude, and rightfully so, if that, what you're saying is true, <laughs> there's no reason to fear God's wrath. But Paul begins his gospel presentation with the wrath of God is being revealed against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men and women. That word wrath in English there is translating the Greek word orge, meaning anger, fury in its context that is manifested in righteous recompense or punishment. We could say and use the word wrath, it's an appropriate way, not in our crazy world of the 21st century anymore, but 100 years ago, easily people talked this way. The wrath of the state of California is enacted upon this murderer. Now, God's wrath is perfect, perfectly just, holy, and right. Wrath here of God does not refer to God losing it or flying off the handle like we sinful human beings do in our anger or wrath. It refers to God's righteous response to our unrighteousness. And notice what your Bible says there. It's not an end or consequence. It's, it, it's not, well, not really, God's not really into this. It's kind of like the way He set things up and it kind of works. So there's a consequence, it's meted out, but it's, it's not really God. It says it's God's wrath. The wrath of God against all unrighteousness of people. It is personal. If, if you open your Bibles and you begin with Genesis, and you go all the way through to the book of Revelation, you will find hundreds of references referring to God's anger and His wrath against human sin. Now here's another thing. In Paul's writings, and he uses this term numerous times concerning God's wrath, in almost all of them, when Paul uses them, he's referring to something in the future that's going to happen. So they just give you just one little taste without reading a whole bunch of them. Just right here in Romans, flip over a page to chapter 2. Paul will, goes on and he says this in verse 5. Because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up, accumulating wrath for yourself on the, here it is, future day, on the day of wrath. When, in the future, God's righteous judgment will be revealed. And then in verse 8, For those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, their future, there will be wrath and fury. Okay, that's normally how he uses it. Go back to verse 18. Chapter 1. And notice here, God's wrath is a present reality. For the wrath of God 
is, meaning now, presently, being, the NIV in their interpretation of it gets it right. Very clear, because that's what it means. It is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. That word revealed in the Greek is a present tense verb, meaning presently now when Paul's writing and with this emphasis of ongoing action, it's being revealed right now continuously. Now we're going to jump forward just to, just for a moment because in the larger context, Paul, he goes on to describe God's present wrath. In verse 24, 26, and 28 of chapter 1, where God, in His wrath, gives us sinners up to more sin as a judgment upon them for their sin. Look at verse 24. Therefore, here's an expression of His present wrath. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Verse 26, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women, exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. Verse 28, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. So in this sense, God's wrath, God's judgment is already here. There's a a future judgment day coming. But this wrath is something that is very present. And you see it everywhere. All the chaos and the immorality and the foolish thinking and foolish believing. It is the reason for God's wrath. And all of that is the manifestation. Of God's wrath. I can go on for an hour and give you examples. I'll just give you one. When medical schools of so called science teach these future doctors to not assign male or female to the baby that comes out of mommy on their birth certificate. What you're seeing is a manifestation of God's wrath. For, Paul says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Okay, now, men, human beings. He goes on to define what he means. Human beings, quote, who by their unrighteousness Suppress the truth. We are all born into this world, as Paul would say in Ephesians 2, as children of God's wrath, because we are all born into sin. And as we develop as human beings into more and more self awareness and consciousness, We then begin and continue to use our unrighteousness, our sinful drives, use them to turn a blind eye to the obvious, to the obvious truth. The ungodliness and the unrighteousness of people that he says there first, it refers to all 
kinds of sin that he's going to list in chapter 1. He's going to just... Here's all these expressions of it. Okay, But notice what he's doing here. There's a, there is one particular sin that he's referring to that's committed by every human being. And it's the one that's the foundation of all the others. It's the sin of suppressing the truth in unrighteousness or by means of our unrighteousness. To suppress here, he, he's saying what we human beings do, and what I'm going to say, you, you're going you're to say, I know that by my experience. The suppression of the truth that he's talking about is when thoughts, thoughts about God, Creator, what might that mean? Ultimate issues, truth start to rise up into our conscious awareness. We, in our sin, push it down. Get back down there into the subconscious. That's what he says. We do that by our unrighteousness, or we do that because of or by means of our sinful desires and sinful living. We, we seek to dull the senses to truth. And what's the truth being suppressed particularly? He says what it is in verses 19 to 23. It's God. The true God. Start with verse 19. For, in other words, he's going to explain what he means by this now. For what can be known about God is plain, clear to them. Because God has shown it to them. In other words, God's wrath, His judgment is just. Because they, He says here, are guilty Guilty for actively suppressing, denying, rationalizing, pushing away the truth. The truth of God's existence and worthiness to be honored by us as creatures of the Creator. The truth that every sinful person suppresses is the truth about what God reveals of Himself in nature. Here, that's what Paul's saying. This is not the truth that one gets from the Bible, God, what we call God's special revelation. It's the revelation of God we get in nature, general revelation. And we are to know this, and we do all know it. Everyone does. Because He has created us in His image, and He has written it in everything that we look at, that He is God and worthy to be thanked and honored. To say everything that exists, a baby's laugh, chemistry, the universe through the telescopes we have floating around in outer space, to my own 
self-awareness. I am. How did I get here? To, to, to see, contemplate any portion of that stuff and to conclude or to say, there is no being who actually brought all this about. Okay. That is utterly anti-intellectual. It is irrational. Paul's right. God has made it plain. Literally now, here's how it should be translated because he's saying it this way from the original. God has made it plain in them. Because He has shown it to them. In them, it's inside of them, and He's shown it outside of us in all things that we look at in creation. And then He explains in verse 20. For His, that is God's, invisible attributes, namely His eternal power, in divine nature have been clearly perceived, seen. Ever since the creation of the world, seen where? In the things that have been made. This knowledge of God is not hidden. And it's not a knowledge that is just for the elite intellects. And there are elite intellects. There are people who have a stronger brain power, higher IQs. And it's not for some elite group of scientists to say, let's look at outer space or creation and try to put the puzzle pieces together and sift through all the evidence and finally come up with a conclusion. There is a God. It's not what Paul's saying. This is clear to a fourth grader. This is, this is clear In plain, so that every person gets it. But I'm an agnostic. Meaning, when we use that term, it means I'm one who proclaims, I'm not saying there's no God, but I don't know whether there is a God or not a God. (laughs) Okay. The agnostics of the world do not have an intellectual problem. That there's just no proof for God. No. It's not the problem. It's not intellectual. They have a moral problem. Their sinful drives lead them to deny what is absolutely clear and obvious. Now, because R.C. Sproul, who now has gone to be with Jesus a few years back, Because he understood Romans chapter 1 for its intended meaning, he tells this story. R.C. says, quote, I was invited to a university campus several years ago to speak to an atheist club. They asked me to present the intellectual case for the existence of God. I did. And as I went through the arguments for the existence of God, I kept things on an intellectual plane. All things were safe and comfortable until I got to the end of my lecture. At that point, I said, I'm giving you arguments for the existence of God. But I have to tell you that I do not have to prove to you that God exists because I think you already know it. Your problem is not that you do not know that God exists. Your problem is that you despise the God whom you know exists. Your problem is not intellectual. It is moral. You hate God. Now from there, R.C. would give him the good news of Jesus to save them from such a blight. But here's the point. We are all guilty by our natures as intellectual 
We have minds that can think like God does and as morally accountable creatures. So, our cat at home is not under that wrath of God like that. I was born into this world, though, and grew to awareness and was clearly guilty because I'm morally accountable. God's justice is against us, Paul says, because his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power. He's the eternal one without beginning, the one who has the, the essence of, he is the essence of existence or being eternally. And his divine God nature, they've hand, they have all been clearly perceived ever since the beginning of creation. They're seen in the things that have been made. And then the next line, therefore, here's, here's Paul the prosecutor in the courtroom. So they are without excuse. In the 1500s, John Calvin writes in his Institutes of the Christian Religion these words, and I read it because, listen carefully, he's just biblical on it. There is within the human mind, and indeed by natural instinct, an awareness of divinity. This we take to be beyond controversy. To prevent anyone from taking refuge in the excuse of ignorance, God himself has implanted in all people a certain understanding of his divine majesty. Ever renewing its memory, he repeatedly sheds fresh drops. It's all out there in creation, the things that he made. And since, therefore, human beings, one and all, perceive that there is a God and that He is their Maker, they are condemned by their own testimony because they have failed to honor Him and to consecrate their lives to His will. And Paul then goes on to say, None of us, therefore, have an excuse and then he tells us why. Verse 21. Here's why. For or because although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but instead became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. That knowledge that we all have as creatures to a creator relationship. That knowledge itself reveals also we owe everything to Him. All glory, all honor, all obedience, all trust to honor His absolute kingship and control and sovereignty, His benevolence, His giving life, breath in all things, his giving heart. And a non-sinful response is, according to the text, thank you. You're awesome. But that's not the route any of us went down. But instead, our thinking became futile, messed up. And our hearts became darkened, meaning 
blacked out to godly affections in response to the reality of God. Even though God cannot be seen because He's invisible, He is clearly seen. He's seen through the things that have been made. It's there, outside of us and within all of us. And that's why, apart from new birth, we are by nature always squashing, pushing, pushing down, suppressing the truth and the inevitable when it starts to come up to our conscience thinking. And we'll use whatever helps to do it. Drugs, alcoholism, workaholism, busyness, Netflix, false religions, idol worship, godless ideologies like Socialism, Marxism, or communism. Our darkened hearts left in our sin and all that we know or who are out there in the world scream, I will not honor Him as God. I'm my own God. Don't tell me how to be, or how to live. And God's wrath is already here. And the day of wrath awaits, because we all do have knowledge. And of that knowledge, we all, in our sin, actively suppress it. We all have family members, friends, Colleagues at work who right now are in bed asleep on Sunday morning. Or they're at their favorite coffee shop. Or they're riding their bike or they're on the drive or maybe already started their hike. This is their Sunday morning week after week. Why? Because nothing is more displeasing to them than to worship God. They don't want to hear about God. Because that would be counter to their life goal of suppressing any true knowledge of the one true God. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give Thanks to him. But instead, they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. The intellect of humanity is really screwed up because of sin. Now, let me say, none of, of that Futility of thinking, none of that means that a person's mind cannot be very sharp and brilliant even, genius brilliant in other fields like mathematics or engineering or physics or chemistry or the arts or philosophy. That's not what it's referring to. It's referring to a foolishness of mind concerning the one big, main, central subject. Yeah, indeed, person. God. God and His glory and worthiness. You see, usually genius types, brilliant people, superior Brain power before conversion, there's a brilliance like, like there was with the Apostle Paul or Athanasius or Aurelius Augustine or Thomas Aquinas or Jonathan Edwards. And then they get born again. And 
They're still brilliant. But now with wisdom from God. There are other brilliant minds like Plato and Aristotle and Machiavelli and Spinoza and Immanuel Kant and Shakespeare and Monet and Friedrich Nietzsche, Albert Einstein. And they all added something to the temporal human experience positively and negatively. But ultimately and personally, each and every one, they were futile in their thinking with darkened, foolish hearts that will be under the wrath of God. So, we're only getting through verse 21 this morning. So let me, let me wrap up, therefore, this portion of Paul's larger argument by saying this. When someone comes up to you because you are a Christian, and then they ask you then, well then... What happens to the poor, innocent person from some small tribe in Africa or the Amazon forest who's never heard of Jesus or the gospel? What happens to them? The answer is simple. You tell them that poor, innocent person will go straight to heaven into God's loving presence when he or she dies. Because that person has no need for a Savior. Jesus didn't come into the world to save the innocent. He didn't come to save non-guilty persons. And you can see the error in the person's question. It's that there are no innocent African or Amazon natives. There are no innocents in the city of Tokyo right now or Los Angeles or New York. You see, the, get, get, don't get confused on how the gospel, when, when, some, when some, you would say, well, here's the problem. I preached Jesus to you and you didn't believe. And because you didn't believe, therefore God judges you. It's not how it works. Be clear on the gospel. People are not condemned because... They rejected Jesus. No, don't get, okay, let me, what I mean is, people, all of us, as Paul argues, starting here in Romans 1, are already under God's wrath. We're already condemned. The indictment has already been leveled against us as guilty and judicially condemned. If you would, either listen or turn to John, the gospel, chapter 3 for a second. And you know it well, but listen to how the gospel of John puts this. Starting with verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son so that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world, which is already condemned, might be saved through Him. That's essentially what He means. Go to verse 18. Next verse, whoever believes in him is not 
condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Let's put John 3 together with Romans 1. Paul writes, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. And therefore, they are without excuse. That's the order. That's the situation. And then Jesus comes. He comes into the world and he lives in perfect obedience sinlessly. And he suffers the penalty, the wrath of God for the sins of everybody who will ever believe in him. And he is resurrected from the dead. And then that message of salvation, it goes out to the guilty sinners who, as John chapter 3 says, are already condemned. They hear the gospel. And one person in the hearing of the gospel, I see it, I believe. And there is no condemnation for that person. The wrath of God is removed, and they know it now. Their buddy over here hears the same message and rejects the good news. And that person is condemned already and will remain there. Because he or she has not believed in the name of the only Son of God who could save him from his guilt and condemnation. So, those persons who have never heard of Jesus and then die they will not be punished for rejecting Jesus. But their final destination is under God's wrath for rejecting the one they have heard of and they have seen and they know about. And that's Paul's point. Every single person who has come to an age of accountability knows of God and perceives that He is worthy of all of our trust and our obedience, but then rejects it by suppressing, pushing down the truth. And so, they are without excuse. And the only way for someone to be rescued from that just <clears throat> wrath is through Jesus Christ. And so what Paul, here now as we have entered it this week, what he's doing now in Romans 1 is he setting the foundation for the urgency of the good news of Jesus Christ, which he just said right before this. It, that gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Because in the gospel, God's free gift of absolution Forgiveness of sins and the gift of positive righteousness is offered freely and it's received only one way, by hearts of faith. So if you have not yet received 
that gift. You haven't embraced the Savior. Do so. Let me say it in the words of the Apostle Paul. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself by not counting their sins against them. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God because for our sake, God made Jesus to be the sin offering. The one who knew no sin and never sinned in order that in Him we who believe might become the righteousness of God. And if we're in Christ, what being in Jesus means is to honor Him. To honor Him with thanksgiving, gratitude, adoring Him for who He is, and especially and particularly for the gift of His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. He has made it so we would forever be accepted as He's accepted to the Father for the goal of our pleasure of worshiping and enjoying the Godhead forever. And that begins now in our sinful state on Sunday mornings as we will close out this service with song to grab our hearts, to honor our great God and our King and our Savior and our Father by the power of the Holy Spirit. So let us stand and give all honor and thanksgiving to God our Savior through our Lord Jesus Christ.